So this is the last of the three talks for this session. Uh, this is Discover Our Dioramas by Sue Hepburn and Rebecca Lean from Brighton and Hove Museums and Booth Museum of Natural History. Hello everyone. I'm Sue. And I'm Rebecca. We recognize that we are in the lunchtime slot. <laughs> so hopefully you're all still awake and not desperate for sugar, as we probably are. So we're going to talk a little bit about our projects today and some of the triumphs and some of the trials. We are from Brighton Hove Museums, which very quickly. Hmm. We are five museums in our service, in our portfolio. The Royal Pavilion and Garden, a ridiculous Regency Palace. <laughs> Brighton Museum and Art Gallery, a very Victorian eclectic museum collection. Preston Manor and Garden, an Edward Edwardian Manor House. Hove Museum of Creativity, and the best museum in our collection, obviously, the Booth Museum of Natural History. And our projects we're going to talk about, one was called Discover Our Dioramas, one is called Peopling the Booth. So the Booth Museum of Natural History was awarded a £50,000 grant for a community project that led to the creation of our first new diorama in 92 years. And this diorama was designed by the under 10s audience. Alongside this, we were also given £3,000 from Rampion Wind Farm to research some of the missing stories in the Booth Museum's history, but especially the women's stories that obviously have been left out. So this session, hopefully, we will talk to you a bit more about our projects and about how it gave us the time and space to be very playful with our staff and with our audiences and how we've brought some joy back to the museum post-pandemic. So why a new diorama in the first place? So the Booth Museum is a fantastic collection and it's much loved in Brighton and Hove. It's quite a gem, but it did need a bit of love and it did need something rather big to put it back into the limelight. Uh, the Booth is considered by some to be the birthplace of the natural history diorama. And it was established by Edward Booth, a very early naturalist with an aim to collect one of every species of British bird. He didn't quite get there, but he did get, you know, about two job. birds. Yeah. The dioramas are historic. They're really very beautiful to look at and well conserved. But are they actually understandable to a modern audience, let alone the under 10s that we know are one of our biggest audiences coming in? We wanted to explore ways to connect our present audience to the historical collections that just line every wall of the museum. And dioramas are an absolute ideal way of storytelling and informing everyone, all ages. It's visual, it can get a lot of key information across to audiences very quickly and without the needs for words and to do so in an instant. We needed a diorama that our modern audience could understand and they could relate to. So why the under 10s? As head of learning engagement, the under 10s are one of my all-time favorite species of creatures on the planet. So I'm, I'm all in, we're all in. Um, but after the pandemic, we noticed that our audience had really shifted towards the under 10s, which we think is probably because during lockdown, lots of us realized just how important getting outside and being in nature was. So these children had a greater connection. Obviously, climate change is a bigger interest. Natural history museums are probably the most significant entry point into museums for most children who want to go and see lions, tigers and bears. And they were also coming in because we're a free museum and that cost of living crisis has also hit. But they were an audience we knew very little about. So we wanted to find out more about them. So what did we want to find out? Why are they coming in in the first place? What are they interested in? Where do they see your film screen up there? Where do they see nature in their real lives? Is it in a park? <laughs> Is it on the television? Is it in a book on the internet? Where are they actually seeing and experiencing wildlife? And we wanted to know when you're in the museum, what are your favorite bits of the museum? What don't you like? What makes sense? What doesn't make sense? We wanted to know everything. 
And how we asked them, well, we asked over 3,000 under 10s and their carers all of these wonderful questions. And we asked them in a whole variety of ways. And what was really important to us was that it was an ongoing conversation, and it still is. It wasn't just a survey. It wasn't just a focus group in a closed room. It was an ongoing give and take over 18 months that continues today. But it was also very low fi so you'll see that we've done that on with felt tips and a piece of paper and some stickers. And this really, really helped our audiences because it wasn't so posh and difficult. And what if I give the wrong answer? Oh, it really helped people engage with us and just answer as many questions as possible. So that was a triumph. A trial of it was that it was sometimes a bit too lo-fi for... Yeah. <laughs> some museum staff we like things in nice shiny cases and text panels and then we were doing odd things not quite the royal pavilion standard <laughs> at it was not the royal pavilion standard no and it was also about managing expectations with audiences because if you ask them what they want normally the answer was dinosaur mm. often oh. it was donkey which was oh. an odd one we had shark shark we had a lot of darkness animals in the dark which oh yeah not, not always easy specifics <laughs> or things like can you build a mezzanine so we can stand on it and spy down on the animals from a top and we're like not with this budget no <laughs> so we, we did <laughs> we did realize that we needed to manage expectation as well as asking our wonderful questions so what did they actually ask us so alongside a period of what we'll call creative consultation which was some of what we've just seen one very simple way that we asked our audience, and we continue to do so now, and what actually led to both of the projects, was a simple ask us a question on a postcard. So as you can see on the left. We display them in books and with the questions answered by ourselves and our front of house staff as well. So it turned out within about maybe ooh, a week of doing it that this was actually goldest. Because it was in the centre of the galleries, it wasn't under the eyes of any other staff, so people felt very comfortable asking us some peculiar things, but also some really essential things. So we found out what people didn't know, what they wanted, but also this project, this part of this, was sometimes difficult to maintain. And importantly, now this project has ended, how do we show that we're still listening? So a triumph about this was that we found out more very clearly, but the trial is how we maintain this and how do we show that we are still listening to these questions. So what do they actually ask us? Obviously, there are a lot of very entertaining questions and there still are a lot of very entertaining questions. A third of them are about animals, which is good because we are a natural history museum, so that's perfect. <laughs> A third are about the museum, perfect. Mm -hmm. And a third are about taxidermy. We did have classics, which I have to say, which is a really good classic, such as, can you put my dad in your museum? <laughs> that came up more than once. It did, <laughs> and one time it did come with a phone number as well. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. We did have, a, we did have a, a proposal of marriage. We did have a proposal of marriage, yes. We, we let we that one slide. Did not have a phone number as well. No. Uh, an awful lot of these we do not know the answers to. No. So we did think about <laughs> doing a quiz with natural sciences people. We'll see how much time answers. we have at the end. But it was amazing to find yeah. out what was going on in people's heads when they were walking yeah. around the museum. And a lot of that handwriting was adult. So, you know, it wasn't just under 10. Mm -hmm. Importantly, which, you know, is the mm -hmm. core of things. Importantly, they wanted to know some actual really good questions, you know. They wanted to know, are the animals real? Which I think is a question that comes up 20 times a day. Yeah. <clears throat> Why? And how do you have them? And as you can imagine, that's a big question for everybody at the moment. And the big one, mm -hmm. what is a diorama? Which is really difficult when you are a museum full of dioramas. Mm -hmm. And that is what you're known for. So they asked us lots of questions. And what we learned from it, most importantly, the biggest takeaway of the day is they don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> They're in this museum full of dead stuff and they just don't understand what it is and what's going on. 
So, and as Rebecca said, the question that comes up the most is, is it real? And we go, well, yes, but it's a real taxidermy thing. It's not a real sheep, but it is a real sheep. So, oh. so we've not quite <laughs> figured out how to answer that yet. Um, but in summary, they really, really, really want to know what it is. Mm -hmm. So we realize very quickly, they don't know what taxidermy is, but they really want to know. They don't know what a diorama is. They've got no idea the interiors of dioramas were handcrafted and they're not, it's not a real tree. It will be a papier mache tree. They have very little understanding of the science and the scientific significance of the collections. They have a preconceived idea of Edward Booth as a villain. When we talk about ethical, not ethical in a museum context and natural sciences, that just confuses everybody. They have no idea how taxidermy is made or who makes it. And they really want to know about people. Who made it? Why did you get this stuff? Did you kill it? Why did you kill it? How did you stuff it? The questions are endless. We have, we're on our fourth album full of questions. <laughs> so um, what changes did we make? One very big change was to our Discovery Gallery. Uh, we had a People in the Booth display. So that's 10 new display panels, uh, objects to go with it. And they answered some of these questions, historical, modern. So we started to explain what taxidermy was. We explained what a diorama was. We put faces to who did some of these things historically and now. And we had interactives to sort of get involved with, to touch, to feel. And we took it apart what dioramas and taxidermy actually is. Yeah, And every single panel is led by the questions. So they can see that we're answering those questions directly and they're very dip in and dip out. So you don't have to be bombarded with a huge amount of information. You can dip in and dip out of the bits you are most interested in. So other changes that we made are quick wins. We updated our probably 20 year old book box, which if you wanted to read about how mum and dad found a pet snake and made it better, that would be great. But we reinvented our book box so it now has a really curated selection of books about science about ecology and about conservation and then we also diversified our book box so there's lots of more women in science and lots more people of color in science as well so it's a quick win to actually do that and an awful lot from charity shops as well and then we took all our SEN resources that we have for school like fidget toys ear defenders weighted snakes we get them out for our school groups and then we thought, why aren't we getting these out for everybody? And we put them in the front entrance. So as soon as you walk into the museum, that's the first thing you see. And the feedback we've had from people saying, this has been a game changer. I feel comfortable. I feel comfortable my child might be upset. I feel comfortable that staff support and understand me. So we're now rolling that out across all of our five sites. Uh, thank you. <laughs> So a massive thing that we wanted to do was to establish the Booth Museum longer term as a sort of safe space for, as an eco hub. We're trying to address climate anxiety and we want to be truthful. We want to acknowledge there is a problem, but not to put it all on children and the young audiences that are coming in. We wanted to show achievable goals, highlight positive news and continue people's love of nature. So we're doing that in a few lo-fi ways. Um, we have some take on resources, things like that. We have different sort of panels up and, and we also have a good news board. So we address sort of local news and then news from far away, but always with that positive spin that actually a small, maybe a small measure, a group set efforts, that kind of thing will result in positivity. Um, and that's on the, the first thing and the last thing that you leave the museum with. Okay, so we've only got about a minute left. <laughs> we do talk a lot. And um, so very quickly, how are we decolonizing the under 10s? We're really fortunate in Brighton and Hove that the council is really leading anti-racism and decolonizing the school curriculum. So a lot of the children are way ahead of us, um, but we're really focused in on migration and using that as a narrative throughout the museum. So all animals across time and place, including humans, migrate and we move. So that's been a thread. And we hosted a wonderful teddy bears picnic for the under fives, which some staff didn't know what we were doing. 
Uh, we always tell a polyvocal approach as well. So all of our stories have polyvocal approach. So all voices are valid. So all of those missing stories, we're adding and adding and adding stories. We're not taking stories away, but we're adding to them. Even if we don't know the information, we're explaining why we don't know the information. So people know it's missing. Wrap up now. Why is being playful important? All of these reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so I've gone too far. Hold on. I'll wrap it. So thank you, sis. She wants me to whiz you. Oh, oh isn't of course. Sorry, this is another thing. But the project collaboration, tetrahedron of fire. So all of those are essential elements to the project. So what will be the long-term legacy? Because that's the main thing, isn't it? You can do a project, but what actually happens after us? It's only a museum, or is it? Obviously, we work in a museum, it's very important to us. But museums should no longer be able to justify our huge buildings and our huge running costs, especially after the pandemic, if we aren't offering ourselves to our community as a public space. This means fully opening the doors to our visitors, our neighbours, getting everybody involved and sort of shifting the power in our museums to the audiences. We are wanting to make friends. We're wanting to build longer term relationships. We want to also look at our pre-existing relationships with people and kind of work on that and establish better with them. Our main takeaway in many ways is that people matter. And whether it's our visitors or our staff or our neighbours, disarming ourselves, our history and dislodging any hierarchical or power structures. Our aim going forward is to always have collections at the heart of what we do. And it's vitally important. But we also have to fully meet our audiences as well. And now you get to see the diorama. Here is Jasmine Miles Long, who many of you will know. Yep. I'm sure, and it is here tomorrow. Um, in construction, here it is in situ, and here it is in the final piece. So good audience reaction. Thank you. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> Um, we do have time for one or maybe two questions if the first one's short. Amy, online. Oh, hold on. Ooh. Is it from Jasmine? <laughs> oh, not Jasmine. Could be. Just in case the online. Oh yes. Although actually, if it's online, they should be able to. Okay. Yeah, because it's if I realize and you're happy to repeat it, yeah. Oh, 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 it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Donna Young wants to compliment you on the fact that it seems more like a dialogue rather than just static feedback card. <laughs> and then the question she followed up with Are the albums going online to, mm -hmm. they, because they could be used by teachers as a discussion prompt? Are there any plans for uploading albums in the future or the content online? Well, now there is. Repeat the question. Yes. Uh, I'll repeat the question. Sorry. Oh, the question was, is, are there any plans to upload the children, adult questions online? The answer yes. is yes. Now there is, yes. Slash. <laughs> but our director also wants to make a book of them. Yeah. They were made. Suggested by Jasmine Miles Law. Oh. Anyway, as ever. <laughs> She's on it. <laughs> uh, we have time for, we do have time for more yeah. if there's more questions. Yeah. There's any more? The diorama, just to say, mm. was a garden landscape, mm. which I hope you all got from looking at that, <laughs> which is a wonderful contrast to our very historic, mm. more uh, wild mm. dioramas mm. for now, 92 years later, to come in and actually see the difference mm. that has happened over that time as well and how more urban Brighton and Hope has become. And as a diorama, so when you come into the museum and, as I said, you've got walls, you know, floor to ceiling, diorama, diorama, diorama of birds. When you come around the corner and you see this, and I'm not, we're not just saying that because we're from there, there is a little awe and a little gasp from people because it's this very, very bright, fantastic display, which people can kind of understand and recognize. It's got fantastic art around the middle and you can interact with bits of it and hear nightingale sounds and bring their parakeet yeah. sounds. Visit. Please do visit. And yeah. We've it's got to just go now. understandable. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Did you answer all of the postcard questions? No. <laughs> Not, yet. <laughs> Not yet. Did we answer all the postcard questions? Not yet, but that tetrahedron of fire, our front of house staff are the ones who answer all the questions. And so it's just an ongoing process. It's um, forever now. It's forever. We'll have books. There are a million ridiculous. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you.